Hello everybody. We are going to go ahead and today talk about Cisco 100 gig SR4 optics and breaking them out into 10 25 gig connections using MPO fanout cables. Let's first start with what is MPO and 100 gig SR4? MPO stands for multi-fiber push-on connector and these MPO connectors attach to a ribbon style of fiber cable. They call it a ribbon. There's multiple uh, bundles of fiber cables in there, commonly in 12, 24, and 48 pairs. One other thing is they can be either male or female. These MPO connectors have keys on them, whether it's male or female, they all have keys. They are important to notice their orientation, as you will see later. And these are used to connect into the QSAP optic modules and MPO patches. Now 100 gig SR4 or 100 G SR4 is defined in the IEEE 8023 BM 2015 document. And 100 gig, 100 G base SR4 is a 100 gigabit per second transmission using four lane electrical interface, thus a fibers total running 25 gigabits per second over multi-mode optical fiber for distances of at least 100 meters. And what does it all look like? 100 gig SR4 module here on the left from Cisco is what this looks like. Standard 100 gig module, QSFP28 plugs into our switches. And on the right, let's look at a few things. What we see here is the is MPO12, very common, the keys and lane assignment. So here's the fiber cable we're talking about. Here's the key. In red, you see the keys, the red arrows. This is female because it has the alignment hole. This is a block diagram of a QSFP28 adapter. And notice that it has alignment pins, thus making it male. In fact, as you will see, almost in, especially in the IEEE document, they generally state that the de facto method should be to use female MPO connectors and the QSFP should be male. And that holds true for the Cisco 100G SR4 module. You will always need an MPO12 female connection. Now here's the, the pinout if you looked at how it's all signed. If you looked at the optic, you have four transmit lanes on the left, on the far right, four receive lanes. Now. MPO cables have polarity types, sometimes referred to as methods. One thing I want you to do is to pay very close attention to the key position. Now, there are three types of MPO polarity or methods. There's type A, which is a straight through. Type B is reversed, rolled if you must. And type C is pairs flipped, but we're not going to discuss that one today. Just A and B. Type A, you will normally see this in a switch to patch scenario. Take notice that you are key up on the left, key down on the right. And as you see, pin one, two, all the way to 12, all line up straight through. Where you see this, let's just say you have switch one on the left and switch two is across the data center. You need to connect them together and it's going to go across your MPO fiber plant. A lot of times what you'll see is on switch one, you're going to use this type A. So this goes into the QSFP28 module or the 100 GSR4, and you connect this guy into your MPO. And generally the cassette or the ribbon fibers themselves are, are flipped at some point. And what you would find is on switch two side, it's using a B style cable because the flip has already happened within your infrastructure. Uh, I've only seen that in some pictures that people have provided me. Uh, for the most part, what I've seen is that you technically use B uh, for this case, and it's the fiber plant that has everything uh, that has everything uh, straight through. But my recommendation to you is if you're connecting through cabling infrastructure, consult with your data center manager or network infrastructure manager to determine the type of polarity needed on both sides to achieve a connection using MPOs. Now MPO type B, this is very common in switch to switch direct connections. So let's just say you have switch one and two and they are going to connect directly to each other and with, not through a patch. This is very common. So you see both keys are in the up position, but as you see, everything is rolled. So one at the top, one at the bottom over here. This is what you would use if you need to connect two switches back to back over an MPO 12 connection. You would use a type B reverse cable uh, and once again, most common and in, in switch to switch connections. Uh, and once, like we talked about earlier, if there's type A on one end and it does the flip and there's a flip done in the 
uh, cassette or in the infrastructure, you would use this on the other end. Now let's talk about the 100G SR4 breakout. And I like to refer to this now as fan out. And why? Breakout to me is very tightly is a is a word very tightly coupled with using twin axe cables where it's a sealed unit, QSFP20 on one end, you plug it in, and you are provided four sealed connections that are SFP28 based connections you plug into a switch. So you don't need fiber cables, and they are predetermined lengths. Uh, fan out is different because you're not using a predetermined length sealed cable you're fanning out a single QSFP optic, but you're fanning it out using a fan out cable into four different 10 or 25 gig connections. So let's talk about that. What's the logical and the physical aspects of it? Here on the left, we're gonna see the physical MPO fan out cable. So you have right there your QSFP 28 MPO, so that's your MPO 12. It's female, that would plug into the 100G SR4 optic and here are the four connections it would provide either at 10 or 25 gig. Now in logical I haven't put any actual configuration in here and the reasoning for that is that it's centered around the type of your hardware version, the switch you're using, uh, NXOS, ACI, and the, and the version of code you're running or if you're doing this on another platform Cisco or non-Cisco it, it, it may vary, your mileage may vary on how to configure it but in general it is very 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 simple to do. So for the logical config, know that it's very minimal, trivial effort. N almost 99% of the time, it's just a single line of config that you would create on the CLI or usually just one option you check in, in a GUI interface. So consult your uh, configuration guides based on the version and OS you're running. Let's talk about the benefits of doing this. Why would you want to do this? Well, if you take these multiple top of rack 48 port and 96 port SFP based switches that are 10 or 25 gig, and you have a bunch of them, well, you can start to consolidate. And now you can take these numerous 48 or 96 ports and reduce them down into, very, uh, into fewer, far fewer QSFP 28 based switches where you're breaking out the interface, each of those single QSFP 100 gig interfaces into four connections. And the benefit of fewer switches is very obviously it's going to be less rack space consumed, thus you consume less power. When you consume less power overall, you reduce the heat load. And when you reduce heat load, that just means you're putting less stress on the HVAC system, uh, you have better cooling efficiency in your data center, more reserve cooling in your data center. There are now fewer optics to purchase. There are fewer switches to manage. Your, your cost per 10, 25 gig port reduces. It just keeps reducing and you can still utilize your existing LC fiber plants for 10, 25 gig connectivity. Now let's talk about uh, some questions and myths. Primarily this will be just one myth right now and answer a few questions before the end. One common myth that is propagated quite a bit in discussions about this is this layout increases my failure domain. Now we'll discuss now in two parts. So. Uh, It'd be wrong to call this a parade of horribles, but technically speaking, even these two issues could, if they had, if they were, if they were common enough to happen, would definitely be a parade of horribles for those of us working in um, managing data centers. But the one is that uh, yes, in theory, you're putting four server connection, four server connections in, into a single port. Now, granted, these could be connections to routers or whatever, but for sake of this, it's servers. So yes, you're reducing it down one port now has four server connections into it. So thus you've increased that failure domain of four different servers into one failed optic. The other one is in the event of a total switch failure, you now have four times the number of connections that you have deployed like that completely down. Okay, these are valid arguments to have. But let's look at the reality of a lot of things at play here. And let's start with the optic itself. Optic reliability has increased over the years and it just keeps increasing to where the MTBF or the mean time between failure for especially Cisco optics is well beyond typical corporate usage policies for optics in a data center or any switch. It, we have learned through the years things that can happen, things that will fail and we've learned on those. Uh, so manufacturing methods have gotten better, technology is getting better, we're, we're not rolling backwards, we're moving forwards. And it's just the known fact that 
the reliability of the optic is incredible these days. In fact, when you think about how optics fail, one of the primary reasons behind failure is heat soak or, or becoming overheated. And in my lifetime and what I've seen, when that happens, that's because of a very poor, pro, uh, poor placement of switching in, in, in a rack that's generally coupled with very poor cooling, very poor fan flow, uh, both in, in pulling in cold air and exhausting the hot air completely out of the cabinet of the rack. Uh, those are generally things that no OEM can factor out. So that's still the onus is still on you to ensure that there's proper cooling available in your data center, that airflow, is, that the proper placement of the unit, proper airflow to pull air, draw the cold air in, and making sure that the hot air completely exhausts out, ensuring sufficient flow enough to keep the optics operating within their designed temperatures. So that's primarily one of the biggest reasons optics fail. Uh, talking in next about ASICs and switches altogether, uh, I've seen in, my, in the last decade, I saw one switch where part of the ASIC failed and the other didn't, and half the switch worked, half of it didn't. I've seen that once. And total switch failures, I have, in the last five years, haven't seen one completely die, on, die yet for no reason. Uh, I just haven't. It, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, the thing is, just like with the optics, our you know manufacturing methods and everything are getting better. We have learned from the past of a lot of failures that we've had and, and built upon those to create switches that are ultra reliable, and that their their MTBF is once again for the switch for the entire switch itself, the ASIC everything is beyond that of most organizations' life expectancy of a switch in a data center. You're just not seeing it. And third point here. If you're single homing servers today and you're single homing a, a lot or all your servers, that is a major issue. You're putting yourself at risk. You are creating undue stress upon yourself and, and accepting risk for no good reason. Everything connected today should be connected in, in a pair. So every server should have two connections to two different switches. The preference is an, an MLAG or a VPC pair with servers using LACP or at the very least just active passive connections, right? Anything, but you should never be single homing. And if you dual home to one, to a single switch, you're all you're doing is wasting money at that point. You're not providing any redundancy. Dual, dual homed to two different switches. If you're not doing that, you're just putting yourself at risk and you're doing it, uh, you are accepting it completely by, by doing so. That's not something any OEM can engineer out for you. And now the likelihood, or the likeliness of, let's just say, two switches, two optics that go, and those two optics have connections to the same server. The, the likelihood of two optics in two different switches in the same port that fail at the same time, or at least in a consecutive manner that it causes ser a server or a subset of servers to go down uh, either con concurrently or consecutively in a very short period of time, I haven't seen happen yet. At least not in my life. I'm sure somebody has. Great. Also, the other scenario to that is just both switches failing at the same exact time or in such a consecutive manner that it fails where you cannot get backup connectivity, you can't replace it. I haven't seen yet. In fact, the only times I have seen them are uh, I've seen complete loss of power where m main feed died, battery backup did not work, and diesel generators did not turn on. That is not something anyone can engineer out for you. I have seen malicious attacks where people go in and shut everything down. That's not something any, you know, that's, that's, that's a security issue. Uh, I've seen HVAC failures where things were overheating and shutting down or melting down. And trust me, in that case, way, you had way, I saw way more switches failing because of a thermal overload. A lot of other things were melting down. And once again, not something any OEM can help with. And finally, classically, somebody, messing up the configuration on accident and that's that's human error at that point that's not something anyone can engineer out so the likeliness of it happening organically that's not related to power failure not related to hvac failure a malicious user or a misconfiguration very minimal if at all and finally uh, on the final line i talk about running cisco optics here and the reason i i put it put that on there that running a cisco optic ensures that not only you fully supported but you're also using an optic that is 
that has a lot of QA baked into it. Not only do we have tight control, uh, sys not only does the Cisco have tight control over everything, but when they, they build these optics, they because Cisco, you know, Cisco can't own every third-party device in the world. It's impossible. So instead, it's put to the test. They they test it in these weird, funky conditions, and they're doing it to ensure that they're simulating as many known and sometimes strange or weird operations to ensure that that optic, when plugged into a third-party vendor that supports the our IEEE compliant uh, 100 gig SR4 optic, will work, and that we've done as much due diligence as humanly possible. In that manner, it's t it's like you have the engineer and the accountant, and in this case, when it comes to Cisco Optics, the engineer wins, the accountant loses, because it makes no sense to churn out cheap optics that fail. So when you're thinking about third-party optics, what are they? Think about what their their claim to fame is. We are just like the OEM, just like Cisco, but we're cheaper. Cheap, 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 cheap. You're cheap. Okay. Ask yourself, what are they? What is what are they doing to make it cheap? They're selling something for for that little bit of money. Where's the profit margin? How are they getting it? Well, they they definitely don't have tight control over their supply chain. In fact, they're probably finding ways every single hour of the day to try to source it as cheap as possible from wherever as possible. And then when it's built, do you think they're testing it and all and, and as rigorously as, as Cisco tests their optics? No, no, they're not. Because if they did, the price would go up. In that in that sense. The accountant wins, the engineer loses. You're, you're, you're getting an optic based on an accountant decision. And I'm, I will say that I have experienced twice in my lifetime major issues with third-party optics. One more recent was obviously Cisco equipment using third-party, but that wasn't the largest. The largest was when I was working a long time ago on some HP switching, back when they had still had 3Com uh, in their fold. And I won't mention the name of the company, major telecom organization in North Carolina. They bought a whole bunch of new switches, but they didn't want to buy you know, the OEM HP optics. Instead, they bought all these really, really inexpensive third-party optics. And I'll never forget starting at like 8 p.m. and by 3 a.m. in the morning of running around different buildings, testing this, light, light test, uh, all the code, every, de low level debugs. We couldn't figure out what the problem was. And, it, and we just, it, it, the problem just kind of cascaded around and would show up randomly. And it dawned on me they were using third-party optics, and thankfully I had a, a substantial amount of the OEM optics with me. And we went around and we swapped these out for the OEMs. Now I'm, I'm more than positive, even back then, that HP's OEM optics aren't of, aren't of the same quality and weren't tested as well as Cisco optics are. But nevertheless, they were guaranteed they were tested in a manner to work. When we pulled a subset. A, and we pulled random subsets out, connected to different things, and we just tested it. Those things that we swapped out the optics continued to work. No issues whatsoever. And then the decision was made that they needed to swap, to have an emergency fund to swap all that. So all that money they thought they saved, they lost and had to go with the OEM. So, and, and not to mention how much they had to pay for emergency services to have us come out there in the middle of the night and work all night long and in fact well into the afternoon to get things back to operational so from my experience a long time ago with that and, and more recently uh, you will get what you pay for with third-party optics so when it comes to Cisco trust me when you buy a Cisco optic you're getting an optic where the engineer has won over the accountant you are paying for the for an optic that will work every time all the time and be fully supported going with third party is rolling the dice now, one question is, does Cisco sell the MPO fanout cable? And the answer is no, but you can procure these MPO fanout cables from trusted vendors like Panduit. Now, do you need a female or a male MPO? The Cisco 100 gig SR4 module requires you to buy a cable with a female MPO connection every time. So if Cisco QSP optic for 100 gig SR4, female. And that's it. I hope this has been informative for everybody and I wanna thank you for watching.